Welcome to episode 79 of the Lone Hockey Podcast, where today we're going to be talking about the Utah Hockey Club and their win yesterday against the LA Kings. And it was their first victory at home for them. And some standouts. I really wanted to talk about some standouts in that game. Some players who stood out and some players who really showcased their skill in a variety of ways. And obviously, you look at their top players like Nick Schmaltz and Clayton Keller are going to stand out every single time you watch them. But Sean Dersey coming off a big extension, he looked really good. And a lot of their decor actually looked really good, really engaged. And Sean Dersey was moving really well. His puck movement was very fluid. I thought he made really sound decisions in terms of his puck transporting ability inside breakout situations on outlet situations and also inside the neutral zone transporting the puck as well. And with him, a big component to his game is both transition offense and defense. He's very good transition at both ways. He can transition the puck offensively, but also be engaged as a defenseman on the rush and be engaged inside the neutral zone to attack when he's either with the puck or without the puck, or if he's attacking as a weak side defenseman as that sort of option. He's in for a big year and he could really produce if he's with the right partner playing good ice time consistently. And obviously he's not necessarily guaranteed power play one time with Mikhail Sergeyev there, another whom of which really stood out and we'll get to eventually, but Thursday was quarterback in the second unit last night. Still looked really sound. He looked very fluid, looked very controlled in his passing, his playmaking, and the directions and angles that he was able to pass with. And that's a really good thing for him to stay poised with the puck. It's a really big component to his game. And he's really skilled as a defenseman overall, being able to combine many different elements within his own game. And linking together many different components. He's very positionally sound as well. That's another big thing I didn't realize. I had to watch a little bit more of him to really understand him because I've seen glimpses of him and I've seen his data and I know it really links up together well. At the same time, I still wanted to watch more of him because especially coming off a big extension and that sort of thing, it's going to be really important to see how he plays down the stretch. But he was so good in terms of his angular play and how he's killing plays defensively and transition defense. I thought he was really more reliant on forward skating for his defensive ability. And that's a really unique component. Like a lot of their players, when they step up the line, Utah specifically, they like to gap up using forward skating and using arch plays. So when I talk about arch plays, what I mean is specifically how they route themselves. So when they route to the puck carrier, they attack on an arch instead of attacking on a slant or attacking in a straight line. This is more effective because it allows them to kill the play a little bit more effectively in that sense. So if they're attacking on a straight line, usually it's not the most beneficial because it doesn't allow them to position their feet in the right way. It doesn't allow them to position their stick in the right way and position other aspects of the body in the right way and allow them to rotate a little bit easier. So by moving on an arch, per se, it's much easier for the defenseman to actually gap up in terms of forward skating. So with Dersey, you notice that a lot. I noticed it a lot in transition defense. I noticed a lot on entry denials, and I noticed it a lot at him being able to kill plays along the perimeter outside the dot lane, inside neutral ice. So he was really sound in terms of transition play and transition defense, and I thought that was really noticeable. And his offense, you notice his shot, you notice his playmaking, you notice his instincts inside the offensive zone, you notice those different things. And those are always going to stand out as he's become more consistent in the league. I could see him being a defenseman, again, depending on ice time, depending on power play usage. He could be a guy that eclipses 60-plus points at some point. It could be sooner or later. But the style of play, the overall well-roundedness in his game, he really was one of the biggest standouts Another big standout, I, w- I want to talk about him first, but before I talk about anybody else, is Maverick Lamro. And Maverick Lamro drafted back in 2022 in Montreal by Arizona at the time, obviously now in Utah. He looked really sound. And similar to Jersey in that sense, he he moves really fluidly for a 6-7 defenseman. I was really shocked when I watched him, and I was really impressed with how well he could move and how well he can keep his shoulders square positionally, how well he can maintain depth in the center of gravity, how well he was able to use, use his stick, how well he was able to utilize 
many different components of his skating and his footwork and his angles inside his feet to be able to move with the puck carrier. And sometimes as a six, seven player, even a six, seven, that's been so hard for them to be able to adapt to that because sometimes they're still adapting to their size and their reach. And it takes a little bit more time as they move up, not only the junior ranks, but the pro ranks to be able to figure that out and to really figure out how to utilize it. But with Lamro, you saw a seamless transition. And that's what really surprised me is how for him, he showed a lot of growth in his stick play and his footwork last year in the QMJHL. And that's part of why I believe he became more of a transition offense oriented defenseman, because if he can maneuver that quickly defensively, surely he can find ways to transition pucks quickly offensively. And this could be passing or just generating passes or playmaking aspects in general. And Lamro yesterday, what I really noticed is the pace of his transition defense linked together with his transition offense. So the faster he was able to kill plays defensively on transition against scenarios, the faster he was able to engage in transition offense scenarios, either as a puck carrier, as a puck rusher, or a playmaker and a pass first defenseman. So Lamro is really positionally aware. That was a big thing when it came to him. He was maintaining really good at gaps, and I thought his gaps were really well solidified. So Obviously, he has a longer reach, so that helps him in terms of extending his stick and not overextending at the same time, and then being able to position his stick in a way that allows the middle to be cut off. So he has a longer reach, which gives him a little bit more leverage at that size. But at the same time, he was really good at on the perimeter. He was really good at tracking. His man-on-man coverage in D-zone was really noticeable. And then his ability to kill plays with his body and his physicality and how he was using the hands to engage defenders and be able to separate defenders from the puck was really, really noticeable. And even when he didn't have the puck at the net front, he was very hard to get around because he would use his hands and he'd use his physicality to try and get players away from the net. And most of the time it worked. So Lamar was arguably the biggest standout in terms of these Utah team, because obviously you have the well-known names like Jersey and Sergish out there. But in terms of the new names, he was by far the biggest standout in my eyes because he played so sound defensively. And obviously he stands out for his size at six foot seven alone. And he's an outlier in that sense. But at the same time, he was really utilizing that size to actually play and play effectively and actually shut plays down. So that was a really big standout when it came to him. And then Mikhail Sergeyev, we're talking about all defensemen so far, pretty much. But Sergeyev looked really calm. He looks really healthy. He looks like he was fully engaged. He's the power play one quarterback, and it looks as if he's going to be that for majority, if not all, of the season for Utah in their inaugural year. And th- that power play one, they were moving the puck, and they were zipping the puck around really well. Even the power play two was zipping around as well, but the first unit was zipping around so fast. And obviously, Sergeyev, he has a little bit more opportunity now because he can play that top pairing role consistently in Utah versus with Tampa, there was Victor Hedman there. So he was more often than not second pairing defenseman, even though he was a natural top pairing defenseman already. And so with Sergeyev, what really stood out is his ability to control play, control possession, be able to control his puck movements, and he was really good in terms of puck movement. That was the biggest standout I noticed with Sergeyev, and that's his best component in his game is his puck transporting ability, but also his puck movement and the consistency in which he's passing and the accuracy and the volume at which he passes. He was passing a lot, but the passes he was generating were quality. So he was able to generate a lot of quality passes to teammates and land passes right on the tape of their sticks and he's very effective at doing that and there were a lot of sequences where in transition offense scenarios on power play scenarios and inside the offensive zone both the even strength and power play where he was able to pass in a variety of ways pass in a variety of directions pass on angles and he was able to be effective at doing that and also keeping the puck flat on the ice. He was doing 
a lot of really good passing. And it was really fun to watch from his game specifically and how he was able to do it. The goalies, both the goalies stood out. Connor Ingram started the first half of the game, and then Matt Vallelta the second half. And it looks as if Connor Ingram is going to be the starter this year, and it'll be interesting to see how that works out for them and if that takes a little bit more time or if it's a seamless transition, a seamless fit. It could be a really good fit for Ingram because he's shown some potential as a backup in previous seasons, and he's also – slightly more of a veteran in the league now. So he could really adapt well to that role if he's in more likely than not, he's going to get it. the starting role, being able to have that foundation for his game this season. And there's some other really good players that stood out. Liam O'Brien stood out for his physicality alone. You're not necessarily getting a ton of offense from him, but his physicality, obviously he's in a fight and he was all over the ice physically naturally to his style of play. Ian Cole, that's another one I wanted to touch on. I thought he was really good, and I really liked how engaged he was defensively. Very physical and old school in terms of the ruggedness of his game, and he likes to play more of a shutdown game. He's not an offensive guy. He's not a transition offense guy. He doesn't like to activate a ton offensively. He just likes to play a shutdown style game, and sometimes you need those players to play that style alone, man. It can be a really good balance approach where you have an offensive defenseman paired with an Ian Cole, and Ian Cole can do a lot of the heavy li- heavy lifting because him alone, he was a presence out there in the defensive zone and how he's able to shut plays down. And I wouldn't say he was reliant as much on positioning like a Sergeyev or a Dursey or a Lamero. He was more reliant on his physical play and the aggressiveness in his hands to be able to shut plays down physically. And versus you see guys like Sergeyev and Lamro and Dursey, and those guys, they rely more on their feet and their angles and their positioning and more so on body position to be able to kill plays in that sense. But with Cole, he plays, like I said, more of an old-school style where he's going to kill the play first, and he likes to go after guys physically. He doesn't really care that much about angles or details in his stick work or maintaining a solidified gap consistently, per se. Those things still matter in his game, but he's more reliant on shutting plays down physically. So he's really good at it, too. That's one aspect that really stands out in his game, obviously. Another big standout, and he got some games in with Arizona last year. It'll be interesting to see how he does in a full rookie season if he does play, is Josh Stone. Josh Stone really stood out. I noticed more of him as a checking forward. I didn't notice a ton of his offense. I noticed some of his offense more on the power play because he was stationed around the net front, and he was actually a really big threat around the net. And that has to do with his size and his range. In terms of his checking play, I liked his forecheck. His forechecking was really noticeable in terms of how he's shutting plays down and how he's cutting the middle of the ice off. So usually as F1 in, he would, and he was usually F1 in, especially as a winger, because you don't usually see the center as much as F1 in that sense. But with Doan, when he was the F1, I noticed he would, similar to what I mentioned earlier, he would route on an arc. He would use his stick to cut off the middle, and he positions himself in the middle of the ice to try and make sure that the ice is split in half. So that way, the opposing attacker is only limited to one side of the ice rather than having a D-to-D pass or an outlet play on the weak side of the ice. So Doan really stood out as a checker. I noticed more checking details in his game. You want to see the offense. You don't necessarily want to see checking play. The the Good thing about it is that he had details in his check and play, but you want to see the offense, obviously, from him and for him to produce consistently. That would be a big thing when it comes to his game and how he is able to stand out. Another one is Matias Michelli. Matias Michelli is coming off some really good seasons with Arizona. And his IQ and his small area play were two of the most noticeable things that I really like when watching him. And I've followed him for – quite a while, ever since he was back in the USHL with Dubuque. And then beyond that point, when he went to the Finnish Elite League, which is a really good transition 
somehow, and he was dominant in the Finnish Elite League. And then he translated almost seamlessly to the NHL. And Michelli, his small area game, he's a small player, but he's very elusive. He's very elusive with his feet, his hands, and his overall skill. So his ability to utilize anticipation in small areas and understanding of how to be proactive in small areas with the puck and a stick was really intriguing. And it was one of the most intriguing aspects of his game. I love watching that side of his game. I like watching and actually draw, get drawn towards those smaller players who are a little bit more elusive and have smaller area handling skill, not only with the puck, but with their hockey sense. And Michelli is just naturally one of those guys I gravitate to because I love his style, his approach, and his modern-day game, his modern-day offensive game. And he can play a two-way foundational game too. And that's another thing is that if he gets caught out of position defensively, his feet allow him to get back in position. So he has quick enough feet and quick enough movement to be able to get back in position when needed. And that's a really good thing. Obviously, sometimes he's still adapting. But in terms of offensive play and his line rush play, I really like the the speed that he was able to generate and the effectiveness and consistency when his, within his game that really allowed him to drive play and notched him two assists in the game. So some standouts from that game, and it's going to be interesting to see how that team continues to get better throughout the season.